Right, good day everyone. This is the Hourglass Half Year Report and the 30th September 2023. Right, so we just want to look at what happens. Uh, the half year ended 30th September 2023 versus the half year ended 30th September 2022. Right, so revenue has gone up by 1%. Uh, rental expenses has gone down by 19%. Right, we'll just look at the larger changes in this column in terms of percentage. Right, and the reason is maybe because they're trying to buy properties that house their retail locations so that uh, they don't have to worry about rental, right? And also they can get property income from uh, renting that's the space they buy, the excess space they buy to other people, right? So uh, we look at depreciation, right, of property, plant, and equipment. This has increased probably because of the fact that they are paying less in rental because they buy the properties, right? So Forex exchange, the losses has decreased. This is a good thing, right? And overall, diluted earnings per share has gone down by 7% as compared to the same period last year. Right, so this one is just the numbers every half yearly that I compiled via Excel. Right, uh, I got this from some online resource. Okay, so we can see that uh, it's better to compare September 23 to September 22 primarily because in March, right, uh, if we, 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 we shouldn't compare September 23 to March 23 because of things like the fact that Christmas is within this period, right, and also bonuses, right, and New Year. And these are the periods where I think people spend more money on luxury watches, right? We should remember that this uh, company sells uh, luxury watches, right? So we should expect sales in the half year ending in March to be higher than September. So I think it's correct to compare September to September, all right? So anyway, moving on, right? We just want to look at the fact that this is also a net cash company. So if I look at the cash of the company, which is $206 million, Right, it can cover all its current liabilities, right, which is at $194 million, right? So uh, this is a net cash company, right? So we want to look at their annual report, right? The annual report 2023 is dated, uh, ended 31st March 2023, so it's about six months ago. So earlier, the results were the most recent ones. From here onwards, the results are uh, six months ago results, right? Just I just want to look at how the... Uh, last five years data looks like right so if we look at the last five years data it's quite clear that there's a big gap between uh, FY 2019 to FY 2021 right revenue versus FY 2022 and FY 2023 right so there's a significant jump from here to here all right and the same with the profit margin uh, okay so look at this part right of course FY 2021 looks like slightly better than FY 2022 but the significant jump is here right so the significant jump here uh is almost double, right? This is, this is like almost double that of these values over here. In fact, it's double of the earlier numbers, right? So there's significant improvement in these two years' results, right? And this is just to say that this company has always been a net cash company. As its cash and bank borrowings has always been able to cover its loans and borrowings, right? And free cash flow of this company has always been quite solid. You can see here, positive all along. Right, so uh, all the matrix look good from FY 2022 to FY 2023. Uh, the dated period is between April 2021 to March 2023. So just to get a better sense of what this timeline looks like, right? Earnings per share basically doubled, right? So uh, net margins improving by around 50%. Okay, okay, so again, you can see earnings per share here has gone up as opposed to this by double. Right, it's more or less double, right, this part over here. Right, so uh, we want to look at the price of this uh, stock uh, relative to its profits, right? So if I look at the pre-2021 uh, average price, right, so uh, it's, it's something like uh, from this region, right? So I didn't really do a calculation. I just roughly estimate that its rough price is around 70 cents, right? So it's rough pre-2021 uh, price is 70 cents. If we take it that uh, from then on, the, the profits double, we should expect that the price should double as well, right? And if 70 cents price uh, uh, pre-2021, post-2021, the, the profits double, the price should double as well. So we should expect that if profit double, the price should be 140, right? So I should expect the price gone up to somewhere here. Of course, you can argue that it's above uh, 140 because if you look at the profit margins, it's actually higher than double. La. Okay, this number is clearly higher than double any of these numbers. So there's a possibility that you can say that the profit actually 2.5x, right? Rather than double, and the price should be 175. So I would say that this is the range between uh, where the 
uh, price of the share should be traded if the profit is assumed to be roughly double to 2.5 times, right? So within 140 to 175, which roughly the price currently is, right? Uh, however, if we think about this, right, we must make sure that the profit double and stay there. Lah. Then it can be considered worth 140, right? If the profit double and then come down uh, after that, then the price shouldn't be 140. So this is just an estimate for what the price should be based on its current results, right? However, that, that doesn't project future results, right? So what we care about is what the future holds, right? So anyway, financial highlights, you can see that, yep, this thing probably doubled more or less to this amount, right? Revenue went up in these two years significantly. Right, so we want to see what the chairman says. Okay, so they say uh, all the good numbers, which is great. Right, then they say here that they deployed capital towards acquisition of a prime property in Brisbane, Australia, whose long-term key tenants includes Hermes and the Hourglass. So this is quite a upscale commercial property lah, because both are branded goods, right? Right, both companies sell branded goods, right? The group also continued its shareholder return program by buying back $55 million of their own shares from the market. Right, so everything here is a good thing. Right. So Swiss watch exports grew, right? and they say that this despite the steady decline in the number of watches Switzerland exports. So they're trying to say that the supply is dropping, but somehow the demand is very high. right? So And also the industry growth has been driven by higher value watches at the expense of more entry-level Swiss watches. That means people are buying the expensive stuff, right? probably because they can't go for holidays during this period, which is basically a lockdown throughout the world, right? So you can read all this, which is good. The implication of these statistics is clear. The premium, premium, premiumization of the industry has led to heightened sales performance for the luxury watch category, right? So the Atas watch, uh, the, the expensive watches are actually selling better, right? So the trend is reflected in results, but the tea leaves are also revealing a stark shift in the landscape, right? So this is the issue that I'm concerned with for this talk, whether or not their outperformance the last few years has can be uh, carried on, right? The spring of 2022 was the peak of the secondary market for luxury watches. This was followed by a swift and steep market contact correction, which is still happening now, by the way, that precipitated a decline in consumer desire and demand for watch purchases. It was this very growth in the secondary market values that in part lured newcomers into the hobby, many of them motivated by breathless Bloomberg headlines proclaiming watches to be a better investment class than other asset classes. So he's trying to say that a lot of people came in to buy watches because they could flip it in the secondary market for a lot more money. So I think the, the, the numbers were quite crazy at the peak. I think something like 2022, whereby if you bought a, something like $15,000 watch in the secondary market, sometimes you could flip it for $40,000. Okay, so that was the crazy period that uh, was something like 2022 according to the chairman. Right, those numbers have come down now, by the way, but uh, in general, there are still some watches that you can uh, purchase over retail price and then sell it in secondary market, still above the valuation. So you can still make a profit, lah, but it's not so easy to buy these watches lah, that are in high demand. Right. Yeah, I'm sorry for the cough here. Right. So business outlook, the near to midterm prognosis is not shaping up to be better than the recent financial year past. Right. So they think that rising rates may be an issue and curtail spending, all right, and uh, yeah, so they're they basically worried about inflation, things or things about uh, yeah, protests against the wealthy, yeah, stuff like that. Basically, he's saying the macro outlook doesn't look so good uh, as, as per before. However, right, the most popular watch models from the most designed brands continue to be valued at a premium to retail prices, albeit at a more modest levels, right? So the conclusion is that these few brands remain strong and will emerge even stronger. And the brands that they feel are still strong in the in the market, whether it's at retail prices or at the secondary market, right, are Rolex and uh, Patek Philippe, right? So they, they talk a little bit about here, about uh, why the Rolex is good and here why Patek Philippe is still uh, doing well. Right, so you can pause and read if you wish to. Right, so this is a little bit more about watches. Right, so with that, uh, I'll end my presentation. Thank you for your time.